Hi, I'm David King, the editor and associate publisher of the Alt Weekly, and today I'm joined by Senator Gustavo Rivera, who represents the Bronx, parts of the Bronx. Um, I asked you here today because um, I think to talk about video games. To talk about video games. To talk about video games, of course. Man, let's just let's just put it out there. David, you and I talk more about video games than politics. This is true, and it's been, I mean, it's been a long time now. I mean, and that's why I sort of wanted to have you on, is because it's been uh, since 2009, I think, that we... Well, two thousand. Well, we, we might have met in 2009. Well, I ran in 2010. Right. So I ran in 2010. 2009, I was working for Kirsten Gillibrand right. still. So it is, maybe we met then, but it was more likely during the race. As a yeah. matter of fact, the, uh, and I'm sure you remember this, but for your, for your, for your watchers and <laughs> listeners, uh, when the the last day of the, on, on election day, yep. right before, like it was the last at about eight fifteen on election day, polls close at nine p.m. So at eight fifteen, you were interviewing me at a poll site in my district, and at eight fifteen, I looked around. And I said, at this point, there is literally nothing I can do to change the outcome of this election. So I'll, let's go have a drink. And so we went. With my with a couple of staffers yep. who were staffing me and yourself, and we went to a local diner, and I had a meal, I had a few beers, and then and, and we had a conversation. So as the polls closed on 2010, uh, you you were right literally next to me <laughs> as the polls closed. And I, I, it was a pretty amazing time, and I and that's sort of where I wanted to start. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of set set up for readers, our, our viewers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> forget where what format I'm in. Um, why your run was so important to begin with, and also how it speaks to where we are with the Senate control at the moment. So I think to start, we have to look back at 2006 um, and 2007 with Elliot Spitzer sort of... Oh, you want to go back that yeah, far? Yeah, I, I do. Okay. I do, because this is a governor who decided... Uh, well, he had coattails to begin with. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2006 being at a diner in Troy with Senator Gillibrand mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and... Uh, she so, wasn't a senator yet. Oh, right. She was now senator, senator Gillibrand. She was, she was unelected. No, she was absolutely oh, she un was, she was unelected. Okay. Um, and she was a complete long shot. And people at the time thought it was such an amazing thing that Elliot Spitzer would take the time to make a co-appearance with her, given that she was about to be trounced by John Sweeney, the, the incumbent congressman kick-ass. Um, that was George Bush's name for him. <laughs> anyway, um, so I just recall sort you of You mean that, Congressman got his ass kicked? Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, that, that is what happened. That was his actual... Um, <laughs> and there was also allegations of domestic abuse. So anyway, uh, so anyway, he she won. And obviously, Elliot Spitzer won handily. And he had coattails sort of beyond that in some ways, too, because there was a Democratic surge, it felt like. And he brought... He spent the time helping some Democratic Absolutely. Candidates. And I should mention, at that time, I was working in the Senate. Right. Before I was a senator, I worked for the Senate Democratic Conference. Uh, and in 2006, uh, I was I actually was working in the Senate. Andrea won in 2006. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andrea won in 2006. And I became her chief of staff. I was her, I was her deputy field director in 2006. Uh, five when she ran, and I was her her deputy field director in 2003 when she ran. So I'm sorry, when she ran one and it got stolen from us. That was in 2003. Then in 2005 she won, and then I became her chief of staff. Right. Uh, in no 2006 and 2004. It was so long ago, brother, that it just kind of oh, I get understood. confused. But yes, 2006 was when she won, and I became her chief of staff in 2007. So it was 2004, she ran originally, Andrew Stewart Cousins, now Democratic leader of the Senate. So I helped her win in 2004, got stolen from us, helped her win in 2006, became her chief of staff in 2007. So I was working in the Democratic conference with the express purpose, because I started working there in 2003, mm -hmm. December of 2003. And I was working there with the express purpose of winning enough seats to take over the Democratic majority and be there for redistricting right uh, and that was I remember that it was um, it was Eric Schneiderman who now is Attorney General of course but he was a state senator and I was working for the Democratic Conference I was working for David Patterson in, in the David Patterson uh, Democratic Leaders Office and it was conversations with Eric Schneiderman at the time who kind of laid out his vision for me hmm. uh, it was obviously it was not obviously just his vision but he's right. the one that expressed it to me first he said when I care the things that I care about whether it is on issues of gender equality when there's it's issues of education on issues of criminal justice on issues of anything and everything you can think of 
the place where all this progressive policy goes to die is the state Senate. And so he joined the Senate, took over the DSCC in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And between then and 2008, with the Obama wave, after the Spitzer uh, little ripple, I guess, uh, in 2006, we got enough Democrats to be in the majority. Or I should say, they got enough Democrats because I was not there, yeah, you were, you were and not. it was kind of a debacle, and I guess that's what you're gonna get right. to Right, well, so, so it was a debacle. I, I know that you don't like talking about this, but I think it is important because- Well, no, no, I can talk about it. I just wanna make sure that people understand. Yes. I had none to no, do no, with no, it, because no, 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 I wasn't there. That's but, what but I'm saying. Is, at the same time, it gets it gets replayed in, in curious ways, I think, in the, not only by people who are involved, people who weren't involved, but also the press who covered it. I, I think there is this, this odd, way that it gets processed. So um, given that I actually was, uh, and so, I mean, in some way I had a pretty unique view to some of this, um, given that at the time, the per the, the man who uh, you beat uh, for your What's seat, his name? I don't remember. I, I know you won't say it, but I'll say it. Uh. <laughs> no, I, could, I actually, I, half of, I'm only half joking because I certainly remember his name, but one of the things that was great, and this is a parenthesis because I want to make sure that you tell the story, but the, the first six months after I won, my staff, I told them the mission is that my name and his name are no longer in the same sentence. Because yeah. before it was like, oh, you're the guy that beat Espada. Like that was the one, yep. that, that was how people knew me. And then after I said, but that's the first six months. Within a year, I want to make sure that we're not in the same paragraph. <laughs> and at this point, it's been eight years. Can yeah. you imagine that? Can no, you it's, unbelie it's, like, it's unbelievable. It's crazy. So but it's been eight years, and I have, and and now his name is not even mentioned in my district, which is precisely what we aimed to do. And uh, I, I, on the other hand, I mean, I do think it's quite an accomplishment that you did beat him. Given that, I recall, um, I was, you know, I, I, for some reason, I had Senator Spada's trust. Um, I was invited okay. to his alleged residence in the Bronx, uh, which is clearly his, um, his... It was a repository for stuff that didn't necessarily include people. Well, it, no, <laughs> it did. There were a lot of... There were, there were rooms for kids, and it looked pretty much like a permanent resident for a young, residence for a young couple um, that wasn't him, uh, you know, um, <laughs> which probably could have been his son. And Anyway, um, but, but during this time, I was new to Albany, there was a lot of sort of chaos in the Senate Democrats, Democratic caucus, given conference, given that there, were, there was new power to be had. There were a lot of folks who felt it was their turn to lead. A lot of folks who wanted to help their districts that hadn't been getting the proper funding for years because Republicans had controlled the Senate for a century. Um, just, you know, an insane amount of time. Um, and so, yes, we had Malcolm Smith eventually wind up leader, but Pedro Espada, Hiram Montserrat, a number of folks obviously weren't happy with the situation, and eventually Senate Republicans, I think this is important to point out, mm -hmm. uh, got together with- Including, including our, my 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 good friend, and I actually like him, but yeah. John DeFrancisco. Yeah, John DeFrancisco. swore him in on the floor of the Senate Dean when Scalos. he became leader, and I put in quotation marks. Yeah. It's the good thing that they were in camera, quotation marks. He was leader, they made him leader. Right. They met it, they met it to, to arrange this, to sort of, buy off a spot and bring him over and hire Montserrat. Montserrat. They met at some pretty famous Albany landmarks, uh, Salsa Latina, which is a restaurant I go to with my wife a lot. And uh, we were there the day that apparently one of the meetings occurred. We didn't see it, but just knowing the Times reports, like we were there. And uh, Red Square at the time was an Albany nightclub that a lot of folks went to. They met there to do it. And eventually, so Republicans offered them enough to come over, including... Uh, basically being the leader of the Senate and Pedro Espada, who was... I'm sorry, you forgot the quotation marks. He, right. wanted, he wanted the title because right. he wanted to be the highest ranking Latino in the state. Yes. But he didn't want the responsibility and he certainly couldn't handle the responsibility. What he used it for was to line his pockets even further. So let's just be clear about that. Yes, and um, during that time, I actually went and spent some time at his clinics that he ran. W w eventually, he would get in trouble... Um, for siphoning money that was meant to go to AIDS victims um, to his campaign. Yeah, and this, Medicaid patients in general. It, yes. was, it was a Medicaid clinic in the South Bronx, right. the Soundview, uh, uh, Soundview Health Network, which, to his credit, and I'm going to give him a little bit of credit here, was created in the South Bronx to, in, to, to aid an incredibly needy population. Mm. And it served the needs, and, I'm no, and I know people to this day who work there, as 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 medical uh, as medical personnel as administrative personnel and they told me about how heartbroken they felt because they knew that he was not you know they didn't know how 
how scumbaggy he was, right? And their goal was just to serve the people there. And so, yeah, he stole money from all those folks. Well, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting because we had Joe Bruno here who represented this area, who was the majority leader for so many years. And you can see his large ass and what it's done. There are golden statues. You know, there's a golden bust of him in the, the airport. There's a stadium named after him. I mean, these people benefit. There's literally a golden bust. Yeah. You know, I've never seen it. I've never seen that thing. <laughs> i got to go I mean, and look at it. Yeah. So people, understandably, are impressed that suddenly things are happening, especially in a district that hadn't had a majority leader for, you know, that, to say that, look, you know. So anyway, <laughs> Democrats eventually, during this time, after I think the chamber was frozen for... A number, a few months. A few months. A few months. My mother bought me the picture of a Times Union photographer took of a spot of holding up the key in front of me oh, yeah. to the Senate. Um, and then they they brought him back, but meanwhile the gears had been sort of going to go after him legally and expose sort of all this corruption. So you, when did you decide? When did you know you're getting in this race? When did you? I, I decided that I was going to, to run again. Well, I should tell you, in 2009, in the middle of 2009, I was working in the summer. I was working for Senator Gillibrand, and I was at her office at 49th and 3rd. So I was just 3rd Avenue. I had a friend of mine who worked in the Senate still, uh, and it was it was so long ago that it was in Blackberry Messenger. Okay, <laughs> BBM, right? So he BBM me. I'm, I'm just sitting there at my desk, and I get a BBM for him, and it says, literally, it says, holy shit balls." Espada and Hiram just flipped. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Right, right. What does and that it was, even mean? It, it, right. And, I, and it's, it's until I walked over to the, uh, to, the, to the communications desk in Gillibrand's office, and I said, could you turn on New York One? And there they were raising their hands. At that moment, I said to myself, this guy's got to go. But my first instinct was not to run myself. My first instinct as an operative, what I had been doing for many years, was finding other people to be candidates, helping them with their campaigns. And so... What really came together really quickly, I mean, besides the anger at the beginning, I was I was like just completely losing my mind as far as how angry I was about what this guy was doing. Um, I said, I got to make sure that he goes away. And my first instinct was to find somebody to run against him. So I made a list of people that are community, organiz- that are community organizers, uh, potential people. I made a list and I was not included in it. Mm-hmm. I did not put myself in it. I found who I thought was the best and strongest candidate. And then I started lobbying her and on her behalf to run. And it wasn't until uh, March of 2010. So here we are, there's a primary in June, and I'm sorry, there's a primary in September, Mm. but by June you have to put petitions on the street, but you have, but here we are in March, and I had been lobbying her for very many, 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 many months, and I had been lobbying people on her behalf like she's the best parent, she's the best person. Ultimately she said, I can't do it. I'm not gonna do it. And there's, there's no judgment as I know uh, anybody who knows who runs who has run ever knows that this is something that changes your entire life. So she yeah. made a decision. Yeah, I mean, and on top of that, this isn't an easy race. No, and this is so guy she made a decision. A yeah, she made a decision. She's not going to. So I was here during during Somos. There's a conference that yep. happens every year up in Albany called Somos, and I was here. I I got and when I dis, when somebody told me she's not doing it, I confirmed that that was the case. I went up to my room at what used to be the. Uh, what is now the Albany Hilton, but it used to be the Crown Plaza. Mm-hmm. So I got a bottle of rum. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> I got Don Cucristal. That's a, that's a Puerto Rican rum. I got a bottle of Diet Coke because I want to keep my figure. Oh, yeah. And I got some limes, and I went up to my room, and I drank the entire bottle having a debate with myself between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. or something like that when I decided I got to do this. And so I decided to do it. That was, that was March of 2010. And then it was just a sprint. So I I was at the Gotham Gazette at the time, and I was commuting down uh, to the city a bunch, and we decided to focus on the race because I, and I have to rem- I, I recall being told that this wasn't likely a race you were going to win at first. Um, I recall <laughs> not the to, only one. They told me that too. Dude. <laughs> I recall speaking to John Sampson, who was the leader of the Senate Democrats at the time, and saying, "Hey, yeah, uh, this this guy." Senator Rivera is running against. Well, not I wasn't Senator. Right, I'm no. sorry. Excuse I was just me. a yes. dude. Yeah, <laughs> I am doing a lot of time traveling. Uh, yes, me too. Dude. Yeah, Gustavo <laughs> Rivera is is going to be, you know, challenging the incumbent. What do you think? And he refused to comment. I don't even know. You know, um, so I did spend some time in the district, and obviously there were a lot of shenanigans. There were a lot of things going on with with him trying to 
subvert the vote, block off vote polling places. Like, not as many shenanigans as I expected. Right. I was disappointed. <laughs> it was shenanigan end, in, less almost. <laughs> and perhaps in the end he realized that this was over. But so to, so to bring us to that diner, that was a pretty spectacular moment. I think it sent message a message to a lot of people that there, yeah. there was like a progressive element that could come alive and could challenge the old guard. Uh, Spada, you know, in some ways represented this old school of, of politics that is still alive, um, you know, no doubt. Um, he already served his time. He's back home. Right. He, he is, uh, I think, November of last year was when he, because he served six years, I think, in federal prison, and he, excuse me, he's back home now. So I remember going on the Bronx Talk to discuss your victory, and people were saying, uh, you know, some pretty decently connected Operatives and and pundits, and they're saying, well, now that Democrats are so in this good place, and they're getting rid of these folks who d- didn't have the best interests, you know, policy and their constituents in mind, who should be the leader? What should we do? And like, Gustavo Rivera should be. He just beat the most evil man in America. You know, that's basically how it was was framed. And obviously, that's not the way the Senate works. Mm, but control no, is is even more convoluted. It's I mean, not only is it about you know, it used to just be about uh, seniority and and positioning, but but it's it's become way more complicated. Now we have over the years that have passed, we have another control is sort of the Senate does seem to go back to the Bronx a lot. We have Senator Klein who decided to sort of conference with Republicans after indeed he did he did not enjoy the company of the Democrats or their faith or whatever whatever it was. Um, and so you've been dealing with that since you've been in, in office, mostly. I mean, yeah. there were a couple of years where that wasn't exactly the arrangement. But January of 2011 was when I got sworn in. January of 2011 is when the IDC came to be. Yeah, I It was my fault. I want to make sure that's clear and it's out there. <laughs> Had nothing to do with it. I just was there at the same time. But yeah, it's generally... So the entire time that I've been in the Senate, I have never been in the majority. And it's partly, sadly and tragically, because a group of... Democrats has decided to align with Republicans and not with us. And this governor, Governor Cuomo, has not done, um, I mean, even a fraction of what Spitzer did. And what Spitzer did wasn't particularly super involved. He, he did care, um, but he didn't perhaps put all his weight in. Um, and this governor has said now this year, and he said it a few other times, that he would like to see reunification. Today we had something interesting happen. Um, you just came from... The building. Um, the building. It's an amazingly <laughs> beautiful building, sir. The Capitol, you mean? Yes, yes. Yes, I did come from the Capitol. Um, and you, you've, the Senate Democrats were pushing gun control issues. Indeed. And you tried to bring a vote. Um, and it seemed you had their support of the IDC. Um, there is uh, some... when I, ch- I, I believe what, what, we, what we tried to do today was to force a vote yeah. on a series of bills uh, all of which are commonsensical. We're talking about improving background checks, getting rid of bump stocks, uh, and giving uh, what is known as the uh, as a as an order of protection uh, for people that have been, you know, people that have that have been violent with their spouses or what have you. So we're talking about common sense bills that we wanted to bring up. Uh, and when the vote was taken, we tried to to, to yeah. challenge the to, to we we attached it. It's called the hostile amendment. We attached it to a bill. Um, and obviously the Republicans did not allow for the vote to take place, but we challenged their, their, uh, them, you know, their, their ruling, and ultimately the IDC did vote with us. So they wanted to, according to what they did on the floor today, they would want to see uh, action or at least these bills to be brought to the floor. And that is a change because they have blocked votes that you, or they've blocked hostile amendments before that did favor things they claimed to propose, I, I, you know, as I recall. That, that is a factual or statement, sir. Support, yes, sorry. that is a factual yes. statement. <laughs> so, uh, the state fact obviously did, the governor put a lot of effort into getting that passed, and since then he hasn't really touched guns. It's been off the table. He's in the public talking a lot about it. But these are bills, some of the, that you're pushing, that I've written about for years now, um, you know, Bills concerning domestic violence and guns and th- things that are pretty pretty straightforward, but there has been a stigma because of the backlash to the Safe Act in upstate. And I can't imagine the governor is exactly interested in courting uh, dissent upstate when he's running for re-election. But at the same time, perhaps he's running for president, so maybe he does want to position position himself as more of a liberal. But um, 
what do you think is the fate of, uh, uh, in the end of this legislation? Are you going to, do you think the IDC can make this happen, uh, given that most things happen in the budget rather than? Um, well, I think, listen, I, I think that there is a, in the, the position where we find ourselves now is something I call the orange madness. <laughs> I refuse to refer <laughs> to that person in the, name. in the White House by any other name. I do not, I've never referred to him as the title that he's supposed to have, right? So I refer both to the, uh, the, the, the ambiance that we find ourselves in as well as the person, I call it the orange madness. Now, one of the silver linings of the orange madness is that people have started really paying attention to what is happening in the state of New York. And they're saying to themselves, people of good conscience who will see the attacks that are coming from the national government, they're asking themselves, if we are to defend women, if we are to defend people of color, if we are to defend LGBT folks, if we're to defend immigrants, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we should be doing that in the state of New York because the attacks that are coming from the federal government are unrelenting. And, and they're noticing that the current arrangement does not allow for that to happen. And so the political push that has come, a lot of folks have come along because they realize that it is a political necessity. Uh, so I believe that whether it's on issues of uh, on issues of guns or, or or on issues of taxation or issues of health, for example, I'm the main sponsor of the health care for all bill in the state of New York, which I believe is something that needs to happen in the state. Um, so all of these things, there's a level of political pressure that's happening because of the orange madness. That means that uh, that some of these things are going to come up for a vote. And so I, I believe some of them are going to move. So I've I've. Uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call myself an eternal optimist, but I certainly am someone who looks at the reality of what we have right now. We look at the attacks that are happening at the national government, and we see the fact that that everyday New Yorkers are just saying to themselves, like, we need to do more in this state. And that means that we need to pass legislation to protect people of color, to protect women, to protect immigrants, to protect sick people, to protect kids from guns, all these things. So I think it, this, there is movement in that direction. I have been pushing along for a while, along with many of my colleagues, but I, I believe that this is that, that we're really going to see some actual movement soon. And, uh, you know, obviously the governor made a lot of accommodation for Jeff Klein to be part of these budget negotiations. Uh, he's not someone who technically needs to be involved there? or Not anymore, no. Right. And yet he, he does have a say. And meanwhile, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who is a black woman who represents, uh, who has a conference of folks who represent the most people in the state, yes. in New York City, um, is pushed out routinely. She is not allowed in. The governor claims to support a lot of these things. But the voices of those people, I think, are sort of systematically cut out. Um, and you also bring up, you brought up wanting to be involved for redistricting. And obviously that was another opportunity missed. And the governor didn't perhaps push as hard. He didn't take redistricting to court. He, what he did wind up with was this agreement to sort of change things for the next redistricting, which we are coming up on. Mm -hmm. um, do you have hope? that uh, redistricting the, the new system is going to be any better than... I did not vote for this yeah. uh, for this bill when it came up. Uh, I did not vote for the... It was ultimately what was required was a constitutional amendment. I did not vote for it yeah. when it came to the floor. I did not vote for it when it came up for a vote uh, in the normal process of right of voting uh, because I do not believe that it creates a really independent process. I have a very strong belief that we should not be picking our voters, but our yeah. voters should be picking us. And, and I also believe, and the thing is, is, is both things can be true. I both believe in that as a, as a pr on principle, but also as a political reality, I recognize that the only reason why Republicans are in the majority is because they have created for themselves a, an artificial majority with districts that are gerrymandered halfway to, I mean, they're, they're just like the things that they, that they make with these districts is bananas. The fact that there's a district that I represent downtown, that downstate is 318,000. Some of my colleagues up here represent about 275,000. So they make these huge districts geographically that have smaller populations. They created a district, the 63rd district. Yeah, your, your colleague, Senator Breslin, who Six, represents. No, no, the 63rd district. Oh. The, the, Senator Breslin's district, district has always existed. It changed shape. Right, right, right. The 60, we had, when I came into the Senate in 2010, we had 62 members. Right. But after the redistricting of 2012, because <laughs> 2010 is the, yes. is, is the, uh, uh, um, the census, and then the redistricting happened two years later, the Republicans added a district in upstate New York, mm -hmm. in a part of the state that had lost population, that was an overwhelmingly white district. 
with the purpose of creating a district specifically so that a Republican would win it. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they carved out part of Breslin's district. Yes, they uh, did, and, and they, they created their own. Yeah, so and, they, and they, it's one they lost to, to start with. They, they, they lost it the, now, but. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the point here is that, and I do believe this, if we had a fair redistricting process, which was purely driven by demographics, mm -hmm. which is ultimately what I think should happen, um, we keep communities together. We don't pack or crack them like they do in, La in, in Long Island. In Long Island, you have both the Latino and the black community that have been packed and cracked. These are two things which happen in redistricting. Right. Packing when you take all these people and you put them in one district so you can only have like you can only have yeah. them that you, you control like who's going to get elected in the district or you crack it which is what they do in, in long island where you take a geographic area and you chop it up into four or five regions so and you put it into three or four different districts so that minority population does not have enough voting power to be able to elect someone of their own choosing and they just have to they kind of get watered down as far as political power is concerned i believe that if a system is independent, that we have an independent redistricting uh, process. Both, I believe that on principle is the right thing to do, but I also recognize that it would actually give us a democratic majority for the foreseeable future. Like, until your daughter can vote, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, because the Republicans have been for a very long time creating an artificial majority with their process of redistricting every 10 years. They've done it, they will continue to do it. The process that we have now the one that's going to potentially take over uh, it does not change that, sadly. And, and I believe that we need another one that's actually truly, truly independent. Do you expect Democrats to address this should they take the majority in the next election? I'm, I can tell you that I'm going to certainly be one mm -hmm. of the people that is loudly saying it. But uh, this is see, this is this is one of my this is one of my faults, David. I actually I actually believe this shit. <laughs> Pardon my French, but I actually believe this stuff, and I'm not and I'm not going to stop saying it just right. because. You know, it, it just because I'm I'm going to be on the other side of the of the aisle. I mean, not the other side of the aisle. Certainly, I'm. <laughs> the Republicans will not Something have you want me. To announce. They will never have me. <laughs> it's it's like I'm a crazy I'm a crazy Democrat, crazy liberal. They would never have me. But but it's not going to change when I'm in the majority. I mean, I I want that level mm. of responsibility I, because because I believe it is important. I don't think I don't think power is a dirty <laughs> word. If we did if we say that power is the ability to determine outcomes. There's a reason why I want to be, I want, I'm in government and I want to have a level of power because I want to change policy to positively impact the communities that I care about. Like the pieces of legislation that I sponsor, the thing that the legislative battles that I fight, the budget battles that I fight are all about trying to more fairly distribute the resources that we have in the state and actually more fairly serve the people that I care about. So that's this that's not going to change because I become part of the majority. And certainly as it relates to mm -hmm. redistricting, I am not going to change my tune. I'm actually going to be louder. One of the big issues this year, something I really want to touch on, um, you, uh, the governor obviously this year is talking about bail, ref bail reform something the Senate Democrats have talked about for a while. Yep. You were very involved in Indeed. in the bail reform and uh, creating these uh, bail foundations. Charitable bail organization, yeah. yes. Um, so it's going on in the city. We've seen some upstate now. Um, you basically got the regulations changed to make this work because yep. it was operating in a gray area before. Yep. Um, but we've seen the results. I've seen the results. They lend people the money they would need to be able to... They don't lend right. the people the money. They post right. bail they post on their, their behalf. Bail. Right. And then when as they go into the process, ultimately that money comes back. It's a revolving fund. As long as they continue. Yes. Correct. As long as they show up for the court dates. Mm -hmm. And I think the numbers last time I checked on some of these were around 99%. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 99 point. As people coming for every single court date. And the, and the majority, like over 60%, I can get you the exact numbers, but over 60% of the cases have either been decided or adjudicated. So it's either the people have been the cases have been dismissed or they have come to an agreement. In other words, these people under normal circumstances, under other circumstances, because gladly, yeah. thankfully, now this is the normal that they have access to this stuff. But if they didn't, they would have been potentially sitting in jail. And they would have without. Right. Yeah. And, and so that's uh, if, if you know, Khalif Browder, mm -hmm. the name of that gentleman, he's a he's a gentleman who used to be my constituent before he committed suicide. This was someone who was sitting in jail in Rikers Island for three years, most of it in solitary confinement, because he allegedly stole, stole a backpack, backpack and ultimately the charges were dropped. Had he had access to charitable bail, he would have been at home. Yeah. And instead, he was sitting 
you know, rotting in a jail and then going to a place mentally where he ultimately felt that he had to take his own life. Well, I is, mean, yeah, where is your worth as a human if, if that's correct. what you're done because of correct. the backpack? Uh, but, uh, and one of the things that these organizations do is, is they actually call you and remind you, hey, you've got a court date. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't cost anything. The lawyers I've spoke to who are involved in this are like, you know, it's very simple. They do it for dentist appointments. They yeah. do it for things that aren't going to change your life. And this is something that gets people to show up. Um, so what do you think is realistic for bail reform this year? Is there a way to take what, some, you know, step on some of the successes and, and get to, to a better place statewide? Well, um, I, I, I do I do believe, although, I'm, I'm, although I might not be in agreement with every single part of the bill, I do think that Senator Gennaris' uh, bill that gets rid of cash bail, uh, mm-hmm. I think that that's the direction we need to go through, we need to go in. I do not, I mean, it, we it, all we need to do is look a very, we don't need to take even that closer look at the system and we find out that it is a different system. The criminal justice system is a different system if you are of means and if you're not. So it's like we don't want to be in a situation, and sadly in many instances we are, where people are being punished for being poor. If you don't have access to you know $500 and many, many individuals, like if I had to tell you right now, you need to produce $500 or you're gonna go to jail, like you might not be able to do it. You have poor people that don't have the ability to do that. So I do believe that we need to move in a direction of getting rid of cash bail altogether. Uh, there, there is a there is a process by which we can do this. Uh, there's there's legislation that's been introduced. And again, I might not be in agreement with 100 percent of the bill, but that's not the point. The point is that I do believe that we need to move in that mm-hmm. direction. Um, until we get there, though, I do believe that we need to expand charitable bail. Uh, there are a pr- there are proposals in the budget. Actually, the the governor's budget, uh, at least the thirty day amendments. We have to see what the what the one houses from the right. Senate and the Assembly are, et cetera, and what the ultimate negotiations are. But they actually expand charitable bail. They actually raise the cap, uh, and they ex- expand the excuse me the number of the types of of crimes that you were can be accused of that you can be eligible to right. receive charitable bail. So they which is which are my bills actually. They're they're partly the bills that I've done to actually expand charitable bail. So we have to we have to create a system that is more equitable. Uh, we have to create a system which is more just uh, and we certainly we should change a system that punishes you for being poor. We have to change that. I'd be completely remiss if we didn't talk about more video games? Well, we can, <laughs> we can get that out if you have time. But That's good, good. Go ahead. Uh, I think we need to talk about Puerto Rico. Um, yes. Obviously, you're from there. Your family is there. Um, born and raised. I was born and raised there. You, um, I mean, it's, uh, you've done a lot of work on raising awareness, um, even before, obviously, the storms, the disasters about yep. debt, about, uh, you know, obviously, even the governor and the New York State delegation have a lot of ties to Puerto Rico. Um, I visit there every year. But things have changed dramatically because it entered this national national debate yep um what's it been like i mean you've told me about your family and the struggles they've been through and obviously you're a person of means you're a person who sits on a legislative body that can influence these sort of things and and you explained to me that you know you were in a situation where you're, you're very helpless i mean this is <laughs> watching and so i mean you know obviously folks who aren't in that situation yep. um were in a lot worse shape what's it been like to well, first, first things first, and you know, I and I might have been, I might have gotten into little scuffles with this guy in the past, but but credit where credit is due, mm-hmm. uh, the governor uh, did move resources in a real way very quickly right after the storm. Um, this I know for a fact because I saw it and I was and I and I, I w- have not been to Puerto Rico yet. I'll be in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go down, but so so credit where credit is due. Uh, there were a lot of resources that he moved very, very quickly, both as far as personnel, as far as re- uh, as far as uh, uh, food and water and uh, electrical plants, et cetera, that he moved down there, which I'm, I, I was really thankful for. So I, I will always give him credit for that. But it was it was incredibly difficult because you have well, my parent, well, I was born and raised there. And my, both my parents, my older brother, uh, who's autistic, lives with them, as well as my extended family, uh, aunts and uncles and nep- and, 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 and uh, cousins and what have you. Um, we, I was lucky where I was able to speak to my folks like two days after the storm. The last I heard from them the day of the storm in the morning when it was starting to hit. And then 
two days later, my dad had to drive up to a, uh, a cell tower that was one of the only ones that hadn't been brought down by the storm. And there were like 20 cars parked around it. And he had to sit there with the phone to try to get a signal. Wow. Um, and there, there's a guy, for example, another friend of mine who's um, I, his brother I went to high school with. He's a friend of mine for a long time. And, and he lost power because there was Irma, who was a storm that hit about two weeks before, Maria. Yep. And then Maria hit, and he didn't have electricity since Irma. So he got his electric back on February 4th. So that, I mean, you, you, he had five months where he had no electricity. He never thought he would, it would be in that situation. I think that th we can have a long, long conversation about it. I, I'll tell you this. I did not go down, even though I've had opportunities to, because I figured very quickly and correctly that I was more effective and efficient and helpful from here uh, in the first in the first couple of weeks and certainly months since then there were a lot of things that I managed to I figured out very quickly I'm not the idea guy I am the resources and relationship guy so that meant that when somebody had you know there were there were people I need to ship things down there I got you let me connect you somebody can do that I uh, we have medical evacuations from Puerto Rico we need to get them someplace okay let me figure that out and I made the connections I have money to give where do I give it and I figured that out too so I, I have not gone down, but I'm going to go down in uh, mid-March. Uh, there's places in Puerto Rico that still do not have power. Uh, they still have to boil their, their water in more than half of the island. Um, you, the, the concern here is that this is not a sexy, hot topic anymore. Right. But, there, but, but make no mistake, this is Katrina writ large. This is a, a, a humanitarian crisis that is unparalleled. Uh, and you have, I mean, you had you already had a financial crisis where the island had a seventy-four billion dollar, uh, you know, debt that couldn't pay before the storm, and then since then, only to Florida, uh, there's over four hundred thousand people that traveled from. Puerto Rico yeah. to Florida, just to Florida, to actually leave. Many, some of them have returned, but as an example, my parents with my older brother are now living in Port St. Lucie, just a few minutes from where my brother, old, where my younger brother lives. So that's a situation for a lot of folks. And as you said, we're lucky. My parents were they were already planning on moving. My dad was very good with his with his planning as far as his uh, retirement. So he had resources enough to be able to say like, we're gonna up and move. We're gonna rent the house back in Puerto Rico, sell the cars, and then we're gonna move. There's a lot of folks that didn't have that opportunity. So I, I, the, the, the goal now is to continue to raise awareness and say that this is a long-term process that we have to continue to be involved in. I know that I, I don't have an option. I will remain involved. Uh, but I, I'm not saying that kind of like, I don't have an option. It's like, I, I, there's no other choice. In a weird way, it's similar to me running. Like I ran not necessarily because I was fiending to be an elected official, but because it was a need to do so. And in this case, I will remain involved precisely because there's a need for me to do that. So what are the next steps that New York State can take and New Yorkers can take to help? Two separate things, but. <laughs> well, uh, I think, first of all, don't forget about it. It's happening. There are organizations that are continuing to do work down there uh, that, are, that are important to support I believe the, the first and one that comes to my mind, and I've been working with them a lot, it's called the, a lot, it's called the Maria Fund. Just that simple. If you Google the Maria Fund, you'll find out it was, an, it was a nonprofit that was started by the Center for Popular Democracy mm -hmm. immediately after the storm. And it, the purpose of it is specifically to fund organizations that are already doing work in Puerto Rico. They were doing it before the storm. They did it during the storm when, when government, either federal or the state or local one, was completely invisible or they just couldn't get there, they managed to hold things together, and these organizations have been doing work on the ground, and they will continue to do so. Uh, it is about, it's, and we also have to have a conversation in which some of the elected officials from, the, from New York can be influential, both in federal policy and as well as the relationship between New York and Puerto Rico. We have to have a real, a real honest conversation about the fact that Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, and that this has been, even though the the disaster, right? The the hurricane is not man made. The out the the what happened afterwards, the the aftermath surely has been exacerbated by this colonial situation. Uh, this can no longer continue. It's like there's no we and, and lastly that we need to rebuild uh, 
in a different way. We cannot build the same thing over again because this is just gonna, there's gonna be another storm and something else is gonna happen. So they're, they're finding organizations that you can fund mm-hmm. um, and then individuals that have, that are, that are creative thinkers around issues of, of, uh, of electrical grids, of water purification, of, uh, of, of construction so that it's, uh, so that it's sustainable and, uh, and resistant to the, to the elements. These are things like that, that type of idea is what we need to find to, so they can go down there and they can provide that know-how so that then Puerto Ricans themselves can rebuild in a way that is sustainable, that is resilient. Because if we do not, uh, this is only gonna repeat itself. And, and I know that that's a long, long-term thing. I'll have much more to say after I go, because I'm going to mm-hmm. go and I'm going to be there, and it's, uh, it's just going to be there for like four or five days. But uh, I was t- I was talking to a friend of mine, and I told him I'm doing this, 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 and this, and he's like, "So you coming for two months? What are you What are you doing?" <laughs> and and it's, and I realized there was a lot of stuff that I am to do, but I, I I so I will have much more to say when I go down there and watch and see it for myself and interact with people who have been doing stuff down there since the storm. So I I know you've been active in campaigns for progressives, folks. You really support nationally yep um i know you did some volunteer work for uh elizabeth warren i did uh pretty you, awesome <laughs> you, you've worked for senator gillibrand you deal with uh, governor cuomo mm-hmm. um do you have a perspective on 2020 do you have thoughts on who you'd like to see take the lead or the kind of person you'd like to see take the lead well the first thing is i think that uh, and progressives or democrats or anybody who tells themselves that we don't have another two years to live through are lying to mm-hmm. themselves. Even in the best case scenario, 2018, let's say that that all the predictions are correct and we have a blue wave and we take over Congress and we take over the Senate and we have individuals who are gutsy enough to move forward with with uh, with impeachment, who I, which I believe that there's like, just pick a day, there's something impeachable that this <laughs> monster has done. Yeah. So, so even if that's the case, even if that's the case and we're successful, there's still Mike Pence is still going to be there. Right. All the other people that are that are running, that are running in, in, uh, at governmental agencies are going to be there. So, the, so the the damage is going to be serious and it's going to be harmful, you know, for a very long time. As far as politically in 2020, we have to open ourselves up to the notion that that is a real one that there had that there is a disconnect between what the mainstream Democratic Party was trying to communicate in 2016. Excuse me, and and a lot of Americans. Now, I am not, and I'll say this for the record, I am not saying that if you voted for Donald Trump in 2016, you're a racist. I am saying if you support him to this day, you are a racist. There's no question about that in my mind at all. But there is something to be said about a group of people who did not see a connection with the Democratic message in 2016 because this guy, who was a con man throughout his entire career, presented with them a vision, presented to them a vision that was different, right? They were mm-hmm. saying, I'm an outsider. I can, I can bring, I can, I can do things that the normal political class can't touch because I do these things. Right? So he was doing his con man little dance and people, because they were disconnected from the process, said, you know what, maybe he's got something for me. We have to recognize that that and this is coming. This is coming from a, and I supported Hillary Clinton, but I recognize that the folks that are not the not the Bernie or Bust people, like the like the I, I make a distinction between the uh, uh, the Burners, right? The 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 what is it? The Bernie Burners? What is it? Bernie Bros. The, not the Bernie Bros. No, no, oh. no. Because there there is a distinction. There was people that were saying like the Bernie or Bust people that if it wasn't Bernie as far as the ah, Democratic Bernie nominee Bernie. that it, that they were going to blow up the party. And I was like, Are you insane? Yeah. Do you not see what's hap- What what happened? So, but there were others that were like they, they they were they supported Hillary Clinton even though they were supporters of Hillary. The point is, I believe that as Democratic Party, we have to accept that there is that there was a real message that 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 Bernie had which connected with people in a real way and it was about how to go in a different direction and saying that the current system has not worked for you has not worked for your communities for your families we need to recognize that and sadly I don't think we do sometimes and I have to fight those battles privately all the damn time mm. with folks both at the state level and at the national level uh, and and I certainly I mean I'm, I've never been shy about the fact that again, this is another one of my failings. Maybe I'm, maybe I should be more, more you know, quiet about this. But I, I don't lie to myself about the fact I'm a liberal. I don't mind that term. 
I, I know what it is. I stand up for, for these values and I, because I believe that these values lead to better policy that make life better for people that I care about, right? And so, and, and I believe that we need to be more honest about that. And I, and I believe that if we're gonna be a party that fights for those values, then we need to be a party that fights for those values, not only when it's politically necessary, so, but it is, but it is a battle that's going to be long and hard. So, this is a long way to tell you. I don't know who could potentially be that person. I certainly think that it cannot be some centrist person. It can't be somebody. We cannot win in 2020 against this guy with everything, regardless of the Russian crap. Regardless of that, we're talking about somebody who is very, very skilled at at doing a show for people. Mm. And being able to like, hey, look at you, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? He's able to do that. We can't have somebody who's not a true believer, somebody who who, who can say to you, you know, who, who there's a level of trust that those people, that that person, whomever he or she is, understands the real plight that you're going through. Um, you know, so, so it can't be a centrist. It's got to be somebody that goes in an opposite direction. I, I, I think that Elizabeth Warren would be fantastic. I just, I really... You know, I, I do want her to remain in the Senate, but we're talking about 2020. I would, I would certainly think that that would be a direction that we should go into. But there's a lot of things that can happen between now and then. So. And will you have time in 2018 to get involved in any uh, anything other than the New York Senate? Well, first I have to make sure I get reelected. Right. You know, that's a that's there is a there is a reality in every. So I ran in 2020 and I, 2010, and I have had a challenger every single time since then. I envision that I will have one this year as well. Uh, my goal would be not to have one, but you know, if gifts were horse, you know, if wishes were horses and all that good stuff. <laughs> well, and, so, and, and, I, but I will be involved in Democratic conference in the Democratic conference, making sure that we get all of our members reelected, that we get new members. Uh, I will, I will go where, where it's necessary to go. I will uh, try to convince my staff when they're free time to do some work as well, and we will do what's necessary because ultimately, we need to be in the majority next year. And some of the reasons you have challengers, I mean, obviously have to do with Bronx politics. And um, I do sort of, you have in the past, because of your outspokenness and mm-hmm. because of, I, I think, in your, your principles in a lot of ways, you have rubbed some of your colleagues from the Bronx the wrong way, mm-hmm. or they've rubbed you the wrong way, including Senator Ruben Diaz, who is more conservative, I think, than most people realize uh ever sat you know as a democrat in the senate i think yep. people are sort of unaware that that there are you know there's there's this is a guy who is completely anti same sex marriage same sex marriage and completely anti abortion and uh, now he's on the city council so um new york city council but uh you've you know you've st- stood up for these sort of principles in an environment that doesn't necessarily lend itself to that even though most people sort of probably assume city liberal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's sort of amazing that you've actually had to fight these battles in some ways. Um, I think people wouldn't really, you know, from upstate wouldn't just assume that, that it wasn't easy to be a progressive. <laughs> uh, but sometimes I mean, it's a little difficult. And, yeah. and listen, I, I'm, I acknowledge that there's uh, sometimes, sometimes I don't have patience for certain things. <laughs> And and I and I do recognize that sometimes I just need to I just need to breathe a little bit. Uh, you just mentioned a, a dude who's now in the city council who definitely got under my skin all the time because I just didn't believe that he was that, that he was the type of person that we need representing right. a, a Democrat that we need in, in in our conference. So I was he got under my skin more than in, more than a few times and uh, and and then so he. Uh, proceeded to uh, attack me. He actually backed my opponent every single time in 2010, 2012, 2014, and 2016. Every single time. And he was he's a colleague, right? And so, yeah. so, you know, ultimately, the, the, the thing, I think the proof is in the pudding, if you will. Um, I, have an, I am incredibly blessed to have an amazing staff, a group of people who serve my constituency every single day. I get people who recognize that in the Bronx, uh, my constituency, you know, I could say I have it on lock. And the reason I can say that is because I know the work that my staff do. And I see it because I go out there and people interact with me and they said, thank you for this. Thank you for that. They're thanking my staff for the work that they've done. So, uh, and that ultimately means if I, if that means that to be able to represent them, to be able to represent their interests and be able to come up here and do this work and, uh, which I love, uh, if if that means that every two years I got to deal with some knucklehead that thinks he can take my to take me out, that's <laughs> fine. And plus, dude, I, nobody outworks me. 
like in the campaign trail, I am a, I'm a beast. It doesn't stop. So <laughs> if, if I wake up in the morning, I was like, how am I going to make this person's life miserable today as far as my opponent is concerned? Like I don't, there, there is, there's a drive. I love campaigns for that reason. When I was a staffer, I loved them. When I was, now that I'm a senator, I still go out and knock on doors myself and love doing it, love talking to actual people and say, I'm your representative. I'm not some representative of your representative. I am your right. representative. So I, I, they can come after me. If somebody comes after me every this year, I assume that they will. I'm going to beat their ass in like I've done in the past, and I'll continue to serve my folks as long as they'll have me. So that wraps up the serious line of questioning I, had, oh. I developed. But if you feel like talking video games or Hamilton or anything else, we're <laughs> well, sir. I, I, I will. Say, I will say this. This. This is. I do. I do like that those parts of our conversation because you usually have. You know, we usually talk. It's like, hey, about this bill, about the, and then we say, and then you say, like, what are you playing now? Yeah. We always and and usually our conversations are like. Uh, in your case, it's because you have like you know a life and a family, a four year old, and, and a four year old, which that's, obviously takes a little bit more of your you time. Really need to say. Exactly, yeah. not and, a life, <laughs> <laughs> a four year old. You're taking care of a life. You're, 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 you're this little human who you are. It's uh, pretty amazing. I recommend it. I do. <laughs> it's awesome. It's amazing. It, God bless you. God bless you and your wife. God bless your family. <laughs> I don't think so. Not for me. That's all right. But but in, but in all seriousness, I actually do appreciate those conversations because it's. There's one thing, I will say this, there is one thing I tell people that want to do this work, um, particularly folks that want to be any type of, like, if you're going to fight for social justice, if you want to make things better, uh, and, and if you see how messed up our world is, you can't do that every second of every day because you're a human being, you're going to explode. Yeah. Like, if I have to think about, if I have to think about the orange madness every single day of my life, every second of my life, I would, like, jump off a freaking bridge there i need to have some time to to go and play the witcher and 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 you know be a uh, uh, you know slaying dragons in the plains of i don't know where you know throwing magic around or or sitting down and and, and going and play fallout which i love right yeah, just, me too. just we, exactly we just just like sitting down <laughs> just sitting down and just playing for hours in this in this world that doesn't exist yeah it is, it, is, it is one of the ways, I mean, you, everybody needs to do that. Not everybody's in video games, right? But some people, I don't know, they crochet or they do, you know, they, they, they do bonsai trees or they, they do something else. You watch sports, you, you know, you play a piano, whatever it is that you do, find your time for yourself. Because particularly, I mean, if you're young, if you're in your 20s, like when I was 23, 24, and I was doing campaigns and politics and stuff, I didn't stop at all. It was just go and go all the time. As I've gotten older, and I recognize now that you need that time. So for me, it's video games. Like I love going home at the end of the night, right? And before I go to sleep, I will have an hour where I'll just go somewhere and just like sit like I'm, I'm playing the fractured butthole, but the, which is a <laughs> South, South Park, Park game, and go into South Park for an hour. You know, it just it's like it's just a, a experience that just centers me and then the next day I can wake up and fight the battles again. I have to say it's funny in the response to our NRA article. Uh, Which was, dude, I, I got to tell you, like, like, you're doing great stuff. Like, this, this publication is doing great stuff. The, the article about the women-run strip club is still my favorite. But... <laughs> But that, but Katie like, wrote it. That, that was like this. That was fantastic. But the, but, but, but that, but that, you, you said the NRA is a terrorist organization. We should call it that. Like that type of, that's the type of, that's a, not only is it factual, you're talking about an organization that encourages people to, like, what's happening right now to these kids who are getting no. death threats. They're getting death threats from. They're them. getting death threats. They watched their friends die two weeks ago, and they're getting death threats because they're daring to say, maybe we shouldn't have assault style weapons available on, you know, on a mass scale. Like, really? Yeah. The, so I'm just saying, y'all are doing, so you, you were going to talk about that article, but well, y'all no, doing good stuff. I mean, so obviously we have, I've gotten a slew of, of NRA bots that use the F bomb in every mm -hmm. sentence and tell me I need a lobotomy or to fall down and die or whatever it is. But <laughs> the people who take the time to write emails yes. and are a little more nuanced than they're thinking, only a little, mm -hmm. um, they, they tell me that I've missed the big problem, which is video games. Now, obviously, these are older folks. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, I respond, to, I've taken the time to respond to some of them and say, mm -hmm. you know, 
you probably remember a time when some other medium was scary to, to you know, whether, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously books were thought to have caused, <laughs> you know, violence or inspired mm-hmm. folks. Too realistic movies are doing it. Um, but, you know, it's funny because my daughter, who I don't want to uh, indoctrinate into a video game player, um, you know. Hopefully <laughs> she'll get her on her own. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a way to bond. It's fun with playing Mario Kart or whatever. Yep. Um, but the other day, um, Assassin's Creed Origin, which is based uh, in Egypt, yep. um, completely fantasy. Except Haven't gotten it yet. It's good. It's it's, you, it's, a, it's a really good you, escape. Really good escape. Okay, okay. I'm gonna yeah, you'll it. like it. it it's it. completely... Uh, you disappear into a world ah. for sure. It's great, and it's huge, and it lasts forever. But what they did, they just released uh, a new version that allows you to just tour and learn about the history. Yes, um, I heard. I, I yeah. read about this. Yeah, and that's something my daughter would enjoy, even though she's four. She wants to look, walk around, and look at these weird, you know, things. It's art to look at, uh-huh. uh, which is not violence. It doesn't, you know, and obviously, it's amazing to see someone need to point to video games or books or movies when. The vehicle for violence is so readily accessible and almost, you know, easier to get it in some cases. But anyway, uh, I agree with you about being able to escape, and I think you know that it is very. Yeah, I need it. Yeah, I need it. So I'm glad that I, I need it, and I'm glad that everybody has. I just think that you need to find what what whatever it is that is going to give you that level of escape. If it's just reading a book, if you want to read these, you know, the, the Fifty Shades of Crap or whatever that is, it's like I don't. <laughs> Whatever you got to find something and then just go like and I do comic books too. There's comic book, like full nerd. I told the lady earlier, full nerd. You've seen the Black Panther games. twice. I've seen the Black Panther twice. I, and I tell you, dude, oh my god, it's so damn good. <laughs> Anybody who is who is listening to this, who is watching this, who hasn't gone and seen it, what are you doing? Have turn you... this off right now. Turn it off. Just turn it off. <laughs> go away. Go and watch it right now. It is it is amazing. There's just so much to it. And the the I mean, because this as a as a straight up superhero movie, it hits all the you know hits everything right. You got you got the chases, you've got the the quips, you've got the crazy costumes, you got all the like all the superhero stuff. It moves the story along. So just on that alone, it is a worthwhile watch. But then when you watch the fact when you have almost everybody on screen is this stunning black and brown. The creative team, most of them are black folk. The the I just read this article today, which is something I noticed like the level of equality that exists between the genders is kind of like it's almost so it's almost so awesome that you kind of don't notice it that it's just they are being treated completely as equals in every interaction that happens throughout the movie the the fact that there's just a a subplot which i not a subplot it's one of the main plots but it's kind of revealed about a third of the way in i will not spoil anything i am not that type of person (laughs) but about a third of the way in where you're already enjoying yourself and then this character says something and you're like oh damn it's going deeper in a way that I didn't thought it was going to do it. I was just so I, I haven't gorgeous. seen it, and I'm dying because I. Oh, dude! Fan, I'm but telling you, it is, it is, it is really going to blow your mind. I it's really going to blow your mind. I've heard from some of some of the snippets I've heard, including something you just said, makes me think that a part of Teyanasi Coates' run and sort of the themes of it are included, which just would be mind blowing to me if that's the I, case. I'm, all, the, all that I'm going to tell you is that this is this is a movie that. It, again, it hits all the marks that it needs to hit as far as a superhero blockbuster. And then it goes in directions that no blockbuster has ever gone in, ever. And things that are dealt with on screen, these are not things that are dealt with in normal blockbusters. It bears repeated viewing because it's so gorgeous. Uh, like, oh, the sets and the, and the costumes is just amazing. <laughs> I, I watched it twice. I'm probably going to watch it a third time. But it, but it, it is worthwhile. We should have a conversation just about that after you watch it, because okay. you need I'm to, <laughs> you need to, you need to watch that. I'm telling you, you need to watch that. Mm. Well, thank you so much for coming. I know uh, you were busy today, and but it means a lot that you were able to make the time and spend a, so much time. It's a great pleasure, great pleasure to do it because we don't, we don't get to talk enough anyway. And mm-hmm. I actually, and I actually, like, I kind of like you. Oh, kind of like. <laughs> I gotta, got I'm like still going to buy you a drink. Dude, I feel like like, I ah, we need to do that. But it got, but it, in, other, in all honesty, it got locked in. It got locked in when we had that conversation because we had had conversations before during the campaign back in 2010. But in 2010, when you were. Because you were there at a moment when my life was literally changing. Like I was sitting down and the polls were closing and I was just like completely just being relaxed. Like there is nothing I can do now. I busted my ass for the last five, six months, however much it was. And I just got to leave it to the voters now. And and you were right there. And so it's kind of you kind of got locked into my psyche in a way that, you know, you're not you're not. 
you're not gonna go away, dude. Sorry. Oh well, thank you. It was it was it was it was a uh, quite a moment for me as well, and uh, I think it it was really uh, just what I wanted to talk about here. It informed a lot of the way I've seen politics play out in the state. So it's a, it's um, a great pleasure to, to be here, dude. Thanks so much.